Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benu. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research, and as well, no doubt, we'll air this on Israeli News Live for our viewers there, especially since we have so many people that are interested in Gog of Magog. And how, how is this going to play out, this uh, Ezekiel 38 war? And is there any connection between that and the war we see in Daniel chapter 11? Uh, it may be two different battles, and of course, some might even venture into Psalm 83. We'll look into that tonight as we kind of take a little interesting look at what's going on there. So uh, let's get right into this. Iranian MPs back bill recognized in Jerusalem as Palestinian capital. We see this just coming out uh, uh, as of yesterday, December the 24th. On 20, uh, 2017, this whole issue over Jerusalem after President Trump announced that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. Uh, President Trump, though, did it in kind of an interesting way. He leaves out the, uh, the Temple Mount as being part of Jerusalem for Israel. He keeps that for the Palestinian or the Arabic people that worship there. Uh, and he is, leaves it to a future decision uh, that would render what parts are what. So he doesn't really say all of Jerusalem is the capital of Jerusalem or uh, capital of Israel, which I find found very interesting as we've already brought up. I do believe that many of these nations, including Turkey, uh, we see China, and of course the United States parroting what the Vatican has said. Now China, whether or not they're doing that uh, because they know the deal was already signed and they're just following uh, course with that or not, still remains to be seen because clearly China is a threat uh, to the Roman Empire that we see today. So uh, we see that in Daniel's prophecy. We're going to get into that in just a moment, though. So we move on, though. Pope Francis also is urging peace, a two-state solution in his Christmas address. Uh, Pope Francis brought that out uh, today during his particular Christmas speech. And I, again, it's another issue. Uh, that I have there with the Pope actually declaring a two-state deal, or, or you know, not declaring a two-state deal, but but for the push for a two-state deal. This is very obvious that, like I said, they're just waiting for some type of unrest to be able to make the obvious that was done under Ariel Sharon come into full play. So to me, the two-state solution has been a done deal. Uh, also, as we noticed as well at the United Nations, when they voted, there were only seven small nations that sided with the U.S. on Israel, uh, Jerusalem being Israel's capital, and every one of them were basically like little tiny islands. They were, in fact, uh, the article claims here that if you put all those countries together, all seven of these little small nations, they would fit in the state of Florida. Uh, so, you know, although symbolically it's kind of nice, I think four of the states there are actually supported by the U.S. So, you know, in other words, basically the 128 nations voted uh, against the U.S. action. We also had uh, 35, I think it's 35 nations that abstained on the issue. Uh, but 128 nations against it, against uh, Israel and Jerusalem being her capital. Now, if you remember back in 2017, um, the Paris Peace Conference agrees on two-state solution in the Mideast, but neither Israel nor Palestinians take part. Uh, remember the famous uh, statement by Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, quoted by uh, Yehuda Glick, in one of the interviews we did with Yehuda Glick, that how can you have a marriage if you don't have the bride and the bridegroom there? That was a little bit concerning as well when uh, Yehuda Glick mentioned that because it's exactly what the Rome is trying to do and has been doing with the Mekodeshet, bringing about a marriage of the three monotheistic religions there inside of Israel, which again would call for the dividing of Jerusalem. And that's actually what the Pope is doing as well in his latest address there, uh, is that the, Jerusalem will be divided. Pope Francis uses his Christmas message on Monday to call for a negotiated two-state solution to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict after U.S. President Donald Trump st uh, stoked regional tensions with his recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Francis spoke of the Middle East conflict and other world flashpoints in his Urbi et Orbi, the city and the world, address for days after more than 120 countries backed a UN resolution urging the United States to, to reverse its decision on Jerusalem. Um, so still the thing is though, is the whole point is coming down to again dividing the land. Now if we look at this from a biblical standpoint, 
Some people think about, well, this is Psalm 83 war. Any of those of you that have followed long enough with us here, we have never believed that Psalm 83 is an actual war. Now, Israel is calling out for help of our Heavenly Father because of the mere fact that the nations have gathered against us. But it's not really a war if you look at it. A song, a song, a psalm of Asaph. O God, keep not thou silence, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. Do you remember, too, the Bible says that let everything on the earth keep still, for he is risen up out of his holy habitation. Remember, I think in Revelation it says there's silence in heaven for about the space of a half an hour. And then we have here, Israel is asking God, don't keep silence and hold not thy peace and be not still, O God. So it seems like when God is getting ready to raise up out of his holy habitation, because for him, just the mere standing up could be, I have no idea, we know a thousand uh, years is one day with the Lord. So let's say it takes him however long to stand up from his throne. He's quiet, he's silent there for a moment, then he gets ready to stand up because the evil that is coming against Israel, you know, and he comes to fight for Israel. That's another thing. But watch what it says here. For lo, thine enemies are in an uproar, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. In other words, they lifted up their head, their rosh, their leader. They hold crafty converse against thy people. Al amcha ya'arimu sod. See, th th this particular type of conversion here is very much like a United Nations type of meeting. Uh, they take counsel against, and they take counsel against al Safanehu against thy hidden ones. Now I have really held to this that I believe that the hidden ones are actually your two witnesses. Because they know the two witnesses are coming on the scene, and yet at the same time, Rome has been very busy trying to work, starting with Shimon Perez, and trying to build Israel to a place to where they can create this two-state solution, they can create Jerusalem an international city, and then therefore Rome can bring about its events or versions of, version of events of what is supposed to be the end time scenario and who is supposed to be the Messiah for Israel. Rather than letting God deal with the issue himself, this is what they have in mind. But they know there's one problem. They know that the prophecy in Zechariah as well as uh, written in the book of Revelation speaks about two witnesses or the two olive branches. There's many other places to speak of it. Micah prophesies of the two witnesses. Isaiah and Isaiah chapter 61, the Plowmen there, there are your two witnesses once again. There's so many places in the Old Testament that most people overlook completely. Even the part of Malachi, when Malachi speaks about Elijah would come before the coming of the dreadful, great and dreadful day of the Lord. And when he speaks in there and he speaks about, remember my servant Moses. There again, you have Moses and Elijah right there in the last part of Malachi. And of course, Yeshua does apply half of that to John the Baptist, but he never applies the other half, the turning of the, of the children's hearts to their fathers, which is the Jews of today recognizing that Yeshua is the Messiah. So the thing is, is Rome knows that they're dealing with these two uh, witnesses or these two hidden ones that are coming, and so they take counsel against them. Uh, or, or, or in this case here, you can literally say over them. See, in other words, they want to be able to control how this happens. They have said, come let us cut them off from being a nation, that being that of Israel of today, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent against thee, do they make a covenant. Then we find out who's involved. The tents of Edom, the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarites, Gebal and Ammon and Amalek and Philistine and uh, inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria also has joined with them. They have been an arm to the children of Lot, Silah. Now, this is what I find very interesting. If you look back here on your screen, Assyria is also joined with them. Why does it, why does the scripture even make it sound as if Assyria just was kind of like last to get there? It says, they have been an arm to the children of Lot, Silah. All right, now, the Assyrians are an arm to the children of Lot, which are your what, your Palestinians. And this is why I've said recently, you know, Lot and Abraham were able to get along. 
And the sheep of Lot and Abraham's sheep were able to get along. That would be the Palestinian peoples and the Israeli people. They're able to get along. The problem come in with the shepherds. As we know from the scriptural story there about Abraham and Lot, and it was their shepherds that were fighting with one another. It's the imams and the rabbis. It's the political leaders as well of Israel and of course of the Palestinians, Mahmoud Abbas, Netanyahu. These men here, these are the ones that are always fighting. That's what causes the division. It's the shepherds. The ones that are supposed to be over the flocks, they're the ones causing the problems. All right. So anyway, so he goes on to say there, uh, that you know they, they you know that they have have been an arm to the children of Lot, but it not, and again Ammon, the country of Jordan. Uh, you have Edom, of course. Edom being the tents of Edom, that is. You have to look at the tents. The tents are actually the denominational systems that are joining in with Rome, because Obadiah de clearly declares that Rome is actually the Edom Edomites of today. We have this in Daniel as well. When Daniel speaks in chapter 9, uh, around verse, I think it's verse 24, 25 there, when it speaks about the prince that shall come and says that he would be of the people who destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. Well, that was Titus, the Roman general. And Obadiah also calls him uh, Esau or, or Edom, and he says that you hated your brother. And you made his land desolate. You, you were as one of them that stood there, completely complicit. See, God knew that it wasn't just going to be uh, the Romans that would come down under Titus and destroy uh, Israel. But it would also be the Syrians that would go and help as well. Why? Because Rome had already conquered the Syrians. So he uses their military to go against Israel. Same thing that they're going to do today. They're making a confederacy to come against Israel. Now, we can see even when uh, President Barack Obama was president of the United States and would not uh, veto this resolution about the settlements inside of the West Bank there, uh, that the nations were gathering together. They were all coming against Israel. President Trump in appearance, seems to be very strong with Israel. And I know in a lot of words and deeds he is as well. Very strong and very pro-Israel. But is it more pro the uh, Rothschild Zionist side of Israel? Or is it pro for the remnant that have come home to see the Messiah? And that's where we have to begin to draw the line. That's where we have to begin to really look to see what is the involvement of President Trump with Israel. Is it only siding with those shepherds that are causing the fight between Lot and uh, Lot shepherds and Abraham shepherds. And that's where I see what's happening that is, that is happening right now. Now, but I want to show you though, this is just to set the stage here. Where are we headed at? Well, we're getting very close to the Battle of Gog and Magog, but I want to share some insights with you that will help you think more in terms of who this Gog of Magog really is. If you look at uh, Zechariah chapter 2, And I lifted up mine eyes, and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that spoke with me, What are these? And he said unto me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, and I've done a lot of cross-referencing in this as well. Uh, but this clearly, and it's not, in the, of course, in the order, because Israel was scattered before Judah was, but notice, these four horns, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, or the house of Judah, the house of Israel, and Jerusalem. Did you ever notice that as well? That's three different times of dispersion. That is two different houses, and it doesn't use the word house there, but just says have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Why is Jerusalem mentioned separately? But then again, if you remember, as I taught from Micah, and it'd probably be good just to bring this up while we're talking about this, because I don't want to don't want to miss anything in here because these things are very important. And I'm thinking about running this on television as well, just how deep this is here. In Micah chapter 4, again, if you go to verse 6. Uh, in that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that is halted, and I will gather her that is driven away, and her that I have afflicted. Okay, the house of Judah. 
and uh, you could also claim it to be the house of Israel as well, both. And I will make her that halted a remnant, her that was cast afar off, a mighty nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from thenceforth even forevermore. And thou, Migdal Eder, the hill of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, yea, the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Now, that's what's important right there too. Notice, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Again, Jerusalem's kind of uh, pulled out to the side from this. Now, why does thy crowd lie aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? Of course, the king, referring back to Samuel, when God used a prophet to lead his nation, but they wanted a king. They got, uh, they ended up getting David, but you know, they got a bunch of roustabouts like Ahab, etc., that married Jezebel and brought idolatry back into Israel. The count, as your counselor perished, you know, that clearly is a reference to Yeshua. Uh, who who the, who is called the uh, the mighty God, uh, the Counselor, Prince of Peace, etc. And pains have taken hold of thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and shalt dwell in the field, and shalt come even unto Babylon. And there shalt thou be rescued, and there shall the Lord redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. So Babylon, or in, According to Revelation, uh, in the book of Revelation, it is Mystery Babylon, which is modern day Rome. That's where they have to be rescued from because they're the ones that have totally grappled Israel in their grip today. And so Rome is controlling everything. But again, this scripture clearly shows that Jerusalem uh, is actually goes into captivity. All right. And that's what we find when we look back over here at Zechariah. These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. How many, th how many of us have ever... I, I, I never really paid attention to that. So I knew that Micah says that we come home, we're there forevermore, but then because of the Tower of Migdal, because of the leaders of our country, we go into captivity again, or at least we're taken away from Jerusalem. And yet, Zechariah prophesies that will happen. Now, let's move a little further, though. In Jeremiah, this is going to kind of help build to show us what's coming against Israel in the modern day. So many people believe it's Russia. Well, all the nations come against Israel, so I'm sure Russia is going to come against Israel as well. I don't think that there's any doubt about that. All right? Um, and if it wasn't for President Trump, We'd have America going against Israel. Now, not that the American people would stand for it, because the, the Christian, um, well, I, would, I still hope we have a majority that stands with Israel, because we know that that's also growing the opposite direction as well. But anyway, notice this right here. This is in Zechariah's, uh, or excuse me, Jeremiah uh, chapter 10, and it says here in verse 22, Hark, a report, uh, actually called Shema, Shema uh, which literally means, uh, listen to the voice. Uh, Hine ba ba'a, uh, behold, he, behold uh, is, it, it cometh. A great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate, a dwelling place of jackals, or dwelling place of dragons. Now, what I find interesting is the fact that literally, see, all right, behold it cometh. Listen to the voice. All right, listen to the voice. Or they just put it on there. Hark, a report, behold it cometh. A great gadol me'ad All right, I forgot up here. All right, and a great commotion out of the north country. Okay, from the land, literally, Me'ad's Tzifon, from the land of the north, or the land of the hidden. All right, and what do they do? To make the cities of Judah desolate, a dwelling place of jackals, or dragons. Now, some might argue this was Babylon, uh, because Jeremiah was writing about this, and I would agree with you as well on that, that Babylon did come down. We did go 70 years into captivity. But as we also know, out of Egypt I call my son has a compound fulfillment and a compound meaning. Uh, we know that it was also the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, but it also represented Christ himself coming out of Egypt. And I believe this is exactly what's happening as well, because 
Notice, to make the cities of Judah desolate, a dwelling place of dragons or jackals. All right? Judah never fully became desolate back then, even though it was totally ransacked. Uh, there were still Jews allowed to live there, even after Babylon took, in, to, took into captivity most of the inhabitants of the house of Judah. All right, so, but there were still many of them that were still living there. It doesn't become desolate until 70 AD when the Romans, under Titus' command, as well as the Syrian army, come and fight together to totally burn everything, burn the temple down, everything is totally destroyed. All right. This is the desolate that happens there, a dwelling place of jackals. Now, O oh Lord, I know that man's way is not his own, and it is not in man to direct his steps as he walketh. I could not help but think of Yeshua when I read that particular verse there, that it was a, uh, it, it point to the coming of the Messiah, in my, my opinions there. Now, if you move into Zechariah uh, as well, let's see, we're in verse 8. Let me run back up and see which chapter. Chapter 2, verse 8. Okay, and he said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I said, The Lord will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and I will be a glory in the midst of her. Ho, ho, flee then from the land of the north, saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of, he of the heavens, saith the Lord. Now, this was another thing that really caught my attention as well, all right? So we start off, Jerusalem's going to be inhabited, all right? But then the Lord says, Flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, saith the Lord. How, if you think about the verbiage that's used in here, how then does the how do the four winds of heaven that are spread abroad, how does that equate to the land of the north that God says for them to flee from? You see, think about it in correlation with what we just read over here in Jeremiah. All right, Jeremiah, it cometh a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate, a dwelling place of jackals or dragons. All right, so what do we have there? The north country... All right, they come and they make Judah desolate. All right, just like a Babylonian empire covers over many nations. The Roman Empire as well, under Titus the Roman general, they had many nations under their disposal. And so when it says, when we go over here to Zechariah, this is what I find interesting. He says, For uh, uh, oh, flee then from the land of the north, saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, saith the Lord. Because Rome controlled in every direction, every direction Rome controlled at the Roman Empire. And even if you look at the Roman Empire today, some people say, well, there's, it's a revived Roman Empire when they looked at the European Union coming into existence. Okay, yes, in one way that's true. I agree with that. But it goes beyond the European Union. Because the Vatican has strong political ties in America, uh, throughout South America, Central America, all of Europe, and even has very strong and political ties in Northern Africa and also is in the Middle East as well. Not in every place, of course, but they have very strong ties. And that's why, as we see all the world leaders that go to Rome and bow down and kiss the Pope's ring in allegiance, so when we see that God says, Flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, saith the Lord. That even includes Russia. Because when Rome wanted to try to overthrow the Russian Orthodox Church, they sent in two Jesuits, Stalin and Lenin. Lenin first, of course, you know, and then Stalin later. And that's what created the communistic nation uh, or, or, or the Soviet Union where they began to gobble up countries around them and stuff that was all under Rome's control. And it got out of hand. Rome had to try to find a way to bring her down. Couldn't, still couldn't defeat the Russian Orthodox Church. Not that the Russian Orthodox Church is much better than the Roman Catholic Church, but the point being, that's what was happening. All right, now, so let's go back now. Now we're going to go into Zechariah. 
I think it's chapter 8. Yes, Zechariah chapter 8. I want you to notice something else here. Very interesting. We're working our way to Gog and Magog, all right? Thus saith the Lord, I return into Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, and the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall yet old men and old women sit in the broad places of Jerusalem, every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the broad places of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the broad places thereof. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if it be a marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people and those days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, I think it's interesting, and I'm just going to make a conjecture on this here. I don't say it so, but I find it interesting that this passage in, 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 in Zechariah chapter 8 may very well be pointing to us a time frame of when these things would be happening. Because Jerusalem is re-inhabited, it's the remnant, and of course, Jerusalem being separate from Israel. Why? Because Israel never has been fully re-inhabited again. Even though they have settlements in the West Bank, etc., the Jewish people never got all of Israel. They only got part of it. And that may have a lot to do with the fact that the house of Judah is not all of Israel to begin with. There are only three of the tribes. All right? But the point is, it specifies Jerusalem. And all of Jerusalem did come back under the authority of the Israeli government when they won the war in 1967, with the exception of the Temple Mount. All right? But if that be the case, and then we read in here that we would see every man with his staff and his hand of very age, the women sitting in the broad places and the men with this, their staff sitting there of very aged, and, of course, the boys and girls playing in the street. Could this be that when the original liberators of Jerusalem in 1967, when they would become old men and old women, very aged, sitting in the street, and their descendants represented by the boys and girls playing in the street, could it be that that is when the calamity begins to come upon Israel? Because... It's almost as if God said a time, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong, yea, they, that hear in these days these words from the mouth of the prophets that were in the days of the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, even the temple that it might be built. For before those days there was no higher for, for man, nor any higher for beast, neither was there any uh, peace to him that went out and it came in because of the adversary. For I set all men, every one, against his neighbors. But now I will not be unto you the remnant of this people as in the former days, saith the Lord of hosts. All right, so it's not that God brings the calamity upon the nation of Israel or bringing about Jerusalem that she will actually have to leave the city, but we find out that according to the scripture there, uh, that it is actually the Tower of Migdal, the leaders of Israel, that would cause the leaving of Jerusalem, as we see prophesied. So, now, with all this in mind, as we've seen clearly in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 22, that north country has nothing to do with Russia. Well, maybe a little bit in part, but, well, no, we couldn't even say in part, because when we look at Jeremiah, we go real quick back to it, Jeremiah 10, 22. A report, behold, it cometh a great commotion out of the north country to, take, to make the cities of Judah desolate, a dwelling place of dragons. All right? Now, then that was the Roman Empire. And that was the only one. Uh, other than the Syrians that came to fight with the Romans to overthrow Jerusalem. All right, and so we find out here in verse 14, we're looking over here now at Ezekiel 38. Uh, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto God, thus saith the Lord uh, God, in that day when my people Israel dwell safely, thou shalt not know it, and thou shalt come from thy place out of the uttermost parts of the north, thou and many peoples with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. 
And thou shalt come up against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land, and it shall be in the end of days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the nations may know me when I shall be sanctified through thee, O God, before their eyes. All right, now, here's what gets interesting. The very word I have here highlighted here, all right, the, uh, the, the mem there with the little dagish underneath that there is the word from. I like saying mean, from. Me'erachati, Siphon, it's literally from the, from the back end of the north. Now, this may be why the translators translate it that the uttermost part of the north, because it may be um, in their minds that as far back in the north, if you go to the back or the rear part, or it can also be translated figuratively as the side flank or on the side. Uh, but it's actually the hinder part is the word. From the hinder part of the north. Well, have you ever thought maybe that the hinder part of the north can either be, seeing that Rome, uh, the modern ancient city of Rome here, was always was considered the north country that came and destroyed Judah. The hinder part of the north could be somewhere here the far part of, uh, of Europe as you go off the land, or it could be the opposite way. You know, it could be either way. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be Russia. And in fact, if you look at all the kingdoms that are involved in the Gog of Magog, they're mostly all from Turkey. That's another thing. And interesting that the Turkey is, the President Erdogan is clearly echoing the words of Pope Francis about East Jerusalem being a Palestinian capital there. And if you say, let's say it's the hinder part of the north, then if you go straight, you know, if you're not straight north, but let's say the way the country flows going north like this here, you end up here in the Netherlands or, or Belgium here, Brussels there, and of course we already know where UN headquarters sits at, so just imagine that is a possibility. Just a conjecture. Now also, we go back and we see this here. Thou shalt, uh, as he goes on to say it uh, in verse 16, and thou shalt come up, uh, up against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the end of days, and I will bring you against my land that the nations may know me, and when I shall be sanctified through the Gog before their eyes. Now, my question also comes up, though, like in the case of Daniel, because it's like a storm cloud. If you remember, we have here starting in verse 40, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Now, it doesn't say that at all in Hebrew. All right? It literally speaks right here, Imo, the Melech Negev. All right? The, what happens, the pushing, he shall push with the king of the south. All right? The king of the north and the king of the south are pushing together. And it doesn't say that he will come against him, but Aliyav Melech HaTzephon, he shall come, the, the king of the north shall come over him. And that clearly, and, and he goes on to be with his chariots, with his horsemen, with his many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow as he passes through. And of course, it is Baratzot. It's more than one country. And so I'm beginning to wonder... In this case here, this is the king of the north and the king of the south working together. Um, this is obviously, if we look at this as the king of the north, now we know who the king of the north is simply by going over here to Jeremiah. We can back right back up to Jeremiah 22. It cometh a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate. That was 70 AD. Arguably, we can also say during the time when Jeremiah was here, long before 70 AD, when the Babylonians came. But remember, as I've stated, Mystery Babylon of the book of Revelation is, is the Roman Empire, and they do come and make Judah desolate, and it does become a dwelling place of dragons, because the Vatican is known for its dragons all over everything. All right, so then we jump back over here to Daniel, and we look at this again, and now we're seeing that the north country actually has a king. Now, we also know that there is a prince as well, uh, according to Daniel chapter 9, where it says the prince that shall come would be of the people who destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. And a prince, of course, is only the son of a king. So at this point here, we're looking at the king of the south, king of the north. Now we know that the king of the north is part of that Roman Empire of today. 
whether or not you want to say it's the Pope of Rome or whoever controls the Pope of Rome, the Black Pope, whatever the case may be, it is clearly evident by Jeremiah that the King of the North is Rome, which would make more sense because when we, one, we see that they go and they overtake all these lands, and there's also the, uh, I think it's the Apocalypse of Abraham that actually writes, or either that or the Apocalypse of Thomas, not canonical books of today, but I think it's worth noting because of the relevance to prophet prophecy that the Roman, uh, that the, the, in the last days, the world's economy would be bankrupt because of the Roman soldiers. And that's basically what's happening. All these worlds are bankrupting the world's economy. And that apocryphal writing blames that on Rome. So, it makes more sense. But anyway, we go on down. There is a mention of Russia in here, and that's in verse 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall have frightened him. That who? The king of the north. And he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to take away many. And I have wondered, with, as I've shared with you guys many times on here already before, that the tidings out of the north and out of the east are China and Russia. And it has upset Rome because of the whole issue dealing with North Korea. Uh, North Korea, though, like I said, I, I keep meaning to bring this up to you guys. I forget where it's at now. But North Korea was on the chopping block long ago, just like the other countries that, uh, that were mentioned. Uh, Iraq, Iran, uh, Syria, Lebanon, etc. North Korea was also on a list similar to that to be taken out in the latter days here. So, but nonetheless... Because of Russia's uh, stance on North Korea and China's uh, uncertainty about North Korea, this cr creates a major fear. And when it says here that he will go forth with great fury to destroy and not only to take away many, I don't think it's just speaking about North Korea. This may be where, as I brought up in the news article earlier, those of you that were watching Israeli News Live there, we were talking about uh, the, the threat that Russia is speaking about with the United States. We talked about uh, uh, Russian tanks being brought uh, to uh, closer to the border there with Eastern Europe uh, and, and Southern uh, Russia there, closer to the, to, to the different caucuses there that Russia faces. We talked about the, the generals that are warning uh, that we're on the precipice of an enormous war. We're, uh, we're reminded one mistake could lead to calamity. Uh, we were looking at the live view map of Russia moving a lot of tanks up there near uh, Ukrainian border there, where if it stays on the rail cars, it goes right to Donetsk. Uh, so we're looking at all these different issues coming up. And that would be where we would probably see in Daniel's prophecy that, uh, that you know, he goes away to make away many. He's going to end up fighting Russia as well. But the final battle that will come down uh, would be Ezekiel 38. And I am in agreement as well when those of you that say, well, Ezekiel's war, according to John and Revelation, is fought at the end of the millennial reign. Uh, the question is, is it a compound fulfillment as well? Uh, and that's where I've looked at this in this day here, that we could be seeing a compound fulfillment. Because clearly, Daniel 11 uh, is very similar to that of what we read in Ezekiel 38. Uh, Psalm 83, again, seems to be the preparing of this war. Uh, and then the culmination of it is Ezekiel 38 war when they finally come against Israel the, itself. And we've pretty much seen, with the exception of North Korea, we have seen all the other parts of the scripture fulfilled here where he comes over, king of the south, king of the north, Rome and Israel working together. They have come together. They have come over into the Middle East, overthrown Iraq. Uh, and when I say Israel and uh, in Rome, Rome is using a NATO military force to help uh, defeat all the neighbors around Israel, trying to regain the... Uh, the promise that was given to Abraham that he, his, his children would reign from the Nile River all the way over to the Euphrates River. But, you know, the, the sad thing is, is in truth, this actually happened. You don't have to make a bigger country out of Israel to fulfill that prophecy. The Christians in Syria are part of the children of the house of Israel. Not all of the house of Israel, of course, but they're still part of it. And uh, true, Abraham... Uh, his descendants are scattered in between 
the Nile and the Euphrates. So there's no doubt about that that is still the case even to this day. But the prophecies of the wars that would happen are definitely uh, there. Uh, also where he says, I have power over the treasures of the gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt and Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Both Libya and Ethiopia clearly are in the uh, crosshairs of Rome's uh, military, their NATO forces, taking over all those regions as well. Uh, and then, of course, then comes this tidings out of the east and out of the north that trouble him. And that's going to be the flashpoint from what I can see. Uh, we may find it happening in Syria as we see tonight. Syria is once again under attack by rebel forces. Uh, but we'll just have to wait to see how that all plays out. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. If our broadcast is a blessing to you, would you consider uh, supporting this work? We can't do it without you. You're, you are the ones that make all that happen. Same with you there. If you're watching on Israeli News Live, we thank you for watching and ask you to help partner with us and keep this broadcast uh, alive. And as well as on, uh, on TV, Direct TV channel 367, we're in over 20 million homes. Uh, doesn't mean 20 million people are watching, but maybe do some good if we get 20 million people to watch uh, there. But it's a different audience that normally does not come on the internet as much. So, uh, in fact, we met one recently. Uh, we were with uh, Brother Dan and Sister Julie. Uh, recently here at the Holy Land Experience. I got a chance to spend a little time with him and his wife, and we met a, a, a man and his family that just so happened to only know Israeli News Live because of being on uh, Saturday nights at 10, I think it's 10 or 10.30 p.m. We're there every Saturday night, and he and his family watch faithfully and never knew anything about Israeli News Live being on YouTube. Anyway, God bless you, my brother, if you happen to be watching this program now. And God bless uh, Brother Dan and Sister Julie as well. Really enjoyed our time with them. And, uh, and maybe I'll find out who that brother was that, that called my name in the bank. I'd love to be able to meet that brother as well. God bless you, my brothers, sisters. Shalom. And thank you for watching IsraeliNewsLive.org. Or if you want to help support our, our mailing address here in the United States, is on the screen below. Shalom.